Welcome to the last days. We have entered God's temple. Version 3.0 Easter 2021 is now 50 days into the calendar's rearview mirror. We now enter the second most dramatic and perplexing event in the history of our faith. The first, of course, probably being the death, resurrection of Jesus story. This occurrence during the festival of weeks, Shavuot, or Pentecost, as we call it. But the story of Pentecost, with its noise-filled fury and fire, uneducated Galilean Jewish tradesmen called apostles and followers of Jesus, suddenly speaking in languages of the eastern part of the Roman Empire, is just another chapter in God's revealing story. You might be familiar with associating Pentecost as the church's birthday. Birthdays mark the start of something, the anniversary of a new life entering the world. But the story of Pentecost is not so much new as renewed. The Holy Spirit did not come into the world only exclusively on this day. Scripture already tells us that God's wind, breath, spirit has been present in the world since before there was even a world to be in. God's Spirit, we are reminded, made us into living beings. God's wind blew across the Red Sea or the Sea of Reeds to allow the Israelites to escape Pharaoh's stampeding armies. And God's breath spoke to prophets kings, and even the dry bones of Ezekiel time and time again. God's wind, breath, spirit is seen in a thousand places, doing a thousand things in creativity, saving, and redeeming. I spoke about us being in God's Temple, version 3.0. Let me speak briefly about the earlier versions. Now, unlike software, it's not a case of flaws or bugs or improvements being necessary, but and they certainly were not faulty in design or deceptive in their purposes. Rather, they were the expected ways as God draws into our story for God's wind, breath, spirit to encounter humanity. Up until the Exodus story, God speaks first to individuals we generally identify as the patriarchs, the names of Isaac and Abraham and Jacob, with their apparent shortcomings and flaws, yet God still uses and embraces them and blesses them and their descendants in order that all the world would be blessed. Not that Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob had extraordinary faith, they failed at times, but they were willing to embrace the one who called them out. God chose a family without even a home, not even a homeland, a nomadic family as his permanent family address, just before a version of time that I would call 1.0. Following that, a few hundred years after the last of Jacob's children die, and the Israelites are suffering as slaves in Egypt. The people of Israel are then led out of Egypt by an Israelite raised Egyptian named Moses, the drawn out one. 
Following the exodus from Egypt, the Israelites gather at Mount Sinai to receive God's teachings and directions for building a temporary movable shrine called the tabernacle. This is God's temple 1.0. And when that temple was dedicated, the glory of the Lord fills it in cloud and fire. The people knew that God was present because a wild flame of fire appeared within or above the Holy of Holies, that most sacred space of both the tabernacle and later Solomon's temple in Jerusalem. This wild flame was called the Shekinah, of God. And when Solomon's temple was completed and dedicated in Jerusalem, the same Shekinah that had filled the tabernacle now is moved into this 2.0 upgrade from the 1.0 tabernacle. And yet, as the rituals of tabernacle are incorporated into the priestly roles and duties, the offerings and sacrifices, Voices are speaking of another time to come when all people, not just priestly households, would experience the full glory of God within their lives, unhindered or restricted by tabernacles of expensive fabric or temples of gold and stone. These Prophets spoke of the temple rituals as nothing more than shadows of a coming reality. In our scripture reading today of this amazing and astonishing moment of this spring harvest festival turned Sinai covenant remembrance celebration, Peter utilizes the voice of Joel one of the prophets, for a new hearing and understanding of what God is up to in the moment of that long ago Pentecost day. This activity of speaking the language of the empire among the Jewish followers of Jesus, now speaking in the provincial languages of the scattered Roman Empire where Jews have resided for hundreds of years is God's glory revealed in temples of flesh and bone. Speaking of God's powerful deeds outside of the physical address of the Holy of Holies. Beyond temple or tabernacle precincts and plazas. Now Peter is announcing that a new era, a new exodus, a new journey has begun where God's glory spreads from Jerusalem and to wherever those who now are seen with divided tongues of fire upon their heads above their roofs, so to speak, are sent by the Spirit to collect God's redemption harvest now. It's the inauguration of the season of Temple 3.0, spreading God's spirit from exclusivity to inclusivity, from the priestly class to all class and person. Our list of regional districts of the eastern half of the Roman Empire that Luke gives in stunning detail may be unfamiliar geographical names to us today, but it speaks loudly to those bewildered, devout Jews, with a few skeptics mixed in blaming drink for newfound literacy among backward Galileans, who have gathered from these disparate Districts to experience God's glory from temple observances and practices now encountering God's glory pouring out of the upper room of a house in Jerusalem. Not at the hands or the mouths of temple authorities and priests. 
Pentecost could be called the founding day of the first multinational corporation. Those old and still existing barriers and divisions of language are simply blown away by the Spirit, a reversal of the Babel curse. God's message will not be confined by our structures or divisions, but overwhelms whatever impedes its spread of good news. Among those Jews gathered in Jerusalem from around the eastern Mediterranean emerges this multi-generational, multinational, multilingual, borderless, classless, colorless, genderless church. A new community of God's presence. If we were honest with ourselves, we would recognize that many of our differences we encounter are relatively easy to transcend. Yet often we do not attempt to even remotely cross these barriers, these boundaries, artificial though they may be, or are. For the gospel of Jesus Christ transcends whatever boundaries even we try to place around it, even those imposed by his most fervent and often fault-filled followers. Jesus did not die that we would come to a building that we now call church. He died so that we would become in flesh and blood the church, a flesh and blood container of God's Shekinah into the worlds and places where you live, where you work, where you rest, wherever you are, the temple of God is also with you. This mobile temple offering God's forgiveness, healing, and restoration to all who enter and encounter your life. But make no mistake, we are not independent contractors here. You cannot be a follower of Jesus without a community of followers to learn, love, and serve God together. On that first Pentecost, they were gathered in the one place, likely that former upper room space where Jesus gathered for his last supper and returned through their locked door in the resurrection to their stunned astonishment and amazement and in the midst of their disbelieving themselves. God's wind, breath, spirit now brings new life, a new community liberated by grace, boundless and embracing of all. Each person now is a living temple of the very presence of God. Now the Cretans who gathered there to try to understand in their astonishment what was going on with these newfound linguists, did not cease to be Cretans that day, nor did the Phrygians lose their citizenship. These former identities still existed, still were encountered, but they no longer serve as the barriers or obstacles to God's purpose or plan of redemption. That reuniting and reforming of the fractured world into God's whole agenda and plan. We gathered here to scatter God's presence in the addresses list of our neighbors and our family and our friends. We often associate the church's address as if it is God's formal address for us in our lives. But the lesson of Pentecost is that God's address 
is in constant forward motion. Our divisions too often endorse our preferences as well as our prejudices. God's wind, breath, spirit overwhelms our national arrogance, our biases of culture, class, and race. The Holy Spirit is not about erasing differences, but embracing them. Wherever we say or act as though another is excluded or unworthy, the Spirit reminds us in simple words, them too. The Holy Spirit promises that you never know when God will show up, but at just the right time. Resurrected Jesus has left us, yet promised that the whole God's Spirit would arrive for us. And it did come, and it acts with us and through each of us. This multi-generational, multinational, multilingual, borderless, classless, colorless community has representatives in every age, nation, language, class, and color. It is astonishing how God went from company owned to franchising, from tabernacle to temple, to flesh and bone. When we share kindness, the Shekinah is in the room. When we face our fears with courage, the Shekinah goes with us. When we do what we can to make the world more just and generous, God's wind, breath, spirit is there among us. The Holy Spirit is in franchise mode. And perhaps if it was making a classified offer for us, it would say something along this. Prospective life changer looking for partners to transform the world. All-inclusive, regardless of language, class, national origin, sex, or gender. Immediate hires. In the final days. Will you accept the Spirit's offer to join the community? As inclusive property of God's presence, a partnership of spirit and life. Part of a movement of wholeness overcoming the brokenness of the world must be move in ready and must be gathered and yet ready to go. Amen. <laughs>